Okay, so we can get started now. Thank you everybody for joining us online. We're really excited to have um, this month's speaker, Cole McCormick, and he's joining us from Penn State University. And Cole um, received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Alberta in Canada, and then moved over to the University of Manchester in the UK to complete his PhD in 2023. Um, since then, he's been at Penn State, and Cole's research focuses on dolomite and dolomitization, taking a holistic perspective that incorporates robust field, petrographical, and geochemical characterizations. So recently, Cole has been working on lab-based dolomitization experiments as a postdoc at Penn State. And in case you aren't familiar with um, how our SEDS online webinars run, we will have 40-ish minutes of a presentation followed by questions. And the chat will be fully closed during the presentation. Um, and then we will open it at the end so you can start typing your, your questions in there and we will read them out for you. So hold on to any questions that you have um, and then type them out in the end for us. We're really grateful for our sponsorship from IAS, which allows us to provide all of these um, webinars and, and various content for you free of charge. So thank you to the IAS. And with that, Cole, I will give you the mic and um, thank you again for joining us. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Cole McCormick. I'm a postdoc at the Pennsylvania State University in the United States. Uh, today I'm going to be walking through some recent advance advancements in the characterization of dolomite. And as many of you may know, dolomite can form in many different ways. Uh, so understanding these processes has critical critical implications for our understanding of economic mineralization, reservoir properties for oil and gas extraction and carbon storage. And actually, there's quite a few companies now looking at how we can pull carbon out of the atmosphere through carbonation experiments and precipitating different carbonate minerals. So my background here and really my approach to this presentation range, ranges from the type of dolomite that forms in low temperature settings, such as those on Cenozoic islands, uh, and we see throughout the Caribbean Sea and the South China Sea. We'll then discuss the type of dolomite that forms in high temperature settings, what many people call structurally controlled hydrothermal dolomite. And then I'll end this presentation with some experimental work that we're doing in the laboratory. So I've been interested in dolomite for a very, very long time. I did my bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Alberta up in Canada. And I distinctly remember Brian Jones and Hans Mockel talking about the dolomite problem and some of the fights that people would get into at conferences about this topic. The latter of those two maybe being a little bit more responsible so, for some of those fights. So what is the dolomite problem? The dolomite problem essentially describes the fact that applying Hutton's principle of uniformitarianism where understanding the present is the key to the past, to study dolomite poses several challenges. This occurs because ordered dolomite is widespread in the geological record, but we've never been able to synthesize it in the laboratory under low pressure, low temperature ambient conditions. Ordered dolomite also very rarely forms in modern settings, so why is it so abundant in the geological record? Now, many of you may be familiar with this paper that came out in Science last year, where Kim A.L. claimed to have formed dolomite in the laboratory under near ambient conditions. The key there is near ambient, right? These experiments were actually conducted under an electron beam in a fluid cell that was held at about 80 degrees Celsius. Now, for anyone who's done any of this type of work before, you know that the point where the electron beam strikes a sample will actually be a much higher temperature. And there was no mechanism in that study to measure what the actual temperature was under that electron beam. Furthermore, there's been two comments papers that were published following this original paper, essentially criticizing that Kim et al. did not sufficiently demonstrate that they did, in fact, form ordered dolomite, as opposed to just a calcite crystal structure that happened to have a very high magnesium content. Now, clearly, science is not going to push and advertise these criticisms as much as they did the original paper. It doesn't sell, if you, if you will. All that being said, there's definitely not a consensus within the scientific community here, and the dolomite problem is still alive and well. All right, so just a little bit of an overview of what I'll be talking about today. We'll start with some of the fundamentals, step through these low temperature island type dolomites, and then move on to some high temperature dolomite in structurally controlled settings. Lastly, we'll finish up this presentation with some of the laboratory based dolomitization experiments that I'm working on for my postdoctoral research. So what is dolomite? Dolomite is a mineral with the formula calcium, magnesium, carbonate, two. 
It was originally discovered by Diodat de Dolomieu and named shortly thereafter. The dolomite crystal structure is similar to that of calcite, but is defined as having these alternating layers of calcium, then carbonate, then magnesium, then carbonate. This so-called cation ordering is very important because calcite can also incorporate significant amounts of magnesium into its crystal structure, but without cation ordering, it's incorrect to classify a mineral or a rock as dolomite. Fundamentally, dolomite can form in three different ways. The first mechanism is called dolomitization. Dolomitization is defined as a replacement reaction, which occurs via dissolution precipitation. What that means is we dissolve out two moles of calcium carbonate, so calcite or aragonite, in some magical water that has magnesium in it. Much of the carbonate is conserved in the construction of dolomite, and then one mole of calcium is liberated from the reactant into the solution. The second mechanism to form dolomite is through cementation, which occurs via the direct precipitation from a fluid or an aqueous solution. So as you can see in this reaction here, we're essentially just constructing dolomite from ions in solution here. The last mechanism isn't really a way to form dolomite on its own, but pre-existing crystals can undergo mineralogical stabilization, also often referred to as recrystallization. Now, recrystallization is really the bad guy of this Hollywood blockbuster movie on dolomite because it can largely or entirely overprint the petrographical and geochemical signature of these types of rocks. Now, this is the most widely used classification scheme for dolomite from Sibley and Gregg, 1987. Many of you are probably already aware of this, but just to make this presentation as accessible to as broad of an audience as possible. We typically classify dolomite as having either planar or non-planar crystal boundaries, and those broad groups can be subdivided based on the shape and form of those crystals. So dolomite with planar crystal boundaries can be euhedral on the left, subhedral in the middle, or it can precipitate as a cement here into this open pore space on the right. Similarly, we can subdivide dolomite crystals with non-planar boundaries as being either anhedral or as a cement. So on the left here, we have an example of non-planar A dolomite, which forms these interlocking mosaics of crystals with irregular crystal boundaries. Obviously, in some of the high temperature dolomite section that I'll be dealing with and presenting later on in this presentation, we deal with a lot of what people refer to as saddle dolomite. And saddle dolomite is just a non-planar dolomite cement with curved crystal boundaries and sweeping extinction when examined between cross-polarized light. Okay, so moving on to some examples from natural geological settings. We'll start with the Cenozoic island type dolomite, which are relatively simple in the sense that they're geologically young and they've never been deeply buried. So they've never been subject to any deep burial diagenetic conditions. Therefore, their diagenetic history can kind of be inferred based on the modern physiography and hydrogeology of these settings. Most of these slides and data will come from two different geological settings, the first of which come from Cayman Islands in the Caribbean Sea, and the second of which come from the Shisha Islands, or what some people call the Paracel Islands in the South China Sea. Now, when you compare the stratigraphy of these two settings, they are almost identical. It's striking, really. In both cases, we see a mixture of limestone and dolomite in the basal part of the Miocene section. This trans transitions upwards into completely dolomitized strata in the upper part of the Miocene section. Then dolomite content decreases upwards and throughout the Pliocene, and we lose dolomite entirely up into the Pleistocene. Both of these settings, both of these sets of images come from that completely dolomitized section in the upper part of the Miocene. It's called the Cayman Formation on the left and the Wang Lu Formation on the right. And I'll tell you, these samples are pretty indistinguishable. If I were to give you a hand sample from each locality, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Both settings tend to have these large domal and branching corals with numerous mollusks, green algae, large benthic foraminifera and coral and red algae that forms the matrix. Most of the replacive dolomite here is fabric retentive and microcrystalline, typically less than 64 microns in diameter, and it has a planar subhedral texture. There are also some examples of planar euhedral dolomite cements that fill or line these moldic pores. 
Now, when we study Dolomite in the rock record, we're really trying to answer three fundamental questions. When did dolomitization occur? What is the source of the dolomitizing fluid? And what were the local fluid conditions and temperature of dolomitization? So for these island type dolomites, the most common way that we determine the timing of dolomitization is through the application of strontium isotopes. Rubidium 87 decays to strontium 87, and there's been these secular variations in marine strontium ratios over time. The plot on the lower left here comes from Ru Wang's paper in sedimentary geology, where they compiled strontium isotope ratios from all of these island type dolomites worldwide. And you can see that most of these values fall between 0 0.7089 here to 0 0.7910. This may reinforce the idea originally proposed by David Budd that there's a series of dolomitization events in the late Miocene to early Pliocene. Alternatively, Ruang suggested that these data may be more reflective of a long, continual process rather than discrete events. Nevertheless, there's clearly something going on in the late Miocene to early Pliocene. There's uh, something in the water, as they say. Several studies have also started to raise caution in the application of strontium isotopes to dating dolomite because these values can be highly impacted by non-marine fluids and even trace amounts of aeolian dust, which can contain alochthonous rubidium here, which would dec decay to strontium-87. There's also questions regarding how much strontium is retained from the precursor aragonite versus calcite, and if the strontium isotopic ratios are reset or maybe retain a mixed signal of the limestone deposition and the subsequent dolomitization. So that's how we know when dolomitization occurred. But the next step is to start evaluating the conditions and the source of the dolomitizing fluid. For a long time, this was done by measuring oxygen isotopes in dolomite. We then estimate the temperature of dolomitization. In this case, Bud 1997 used 25 degrees Celsius. We then use an equation to back calculate out what the isotopic composition of the dolomitizing fluid was. More recently, we've developed a technique to measure carbonate clumped isotopes, which is essentially the case where the heavy oxygen isotope is bonded to the heavy carbon isotope. You can he see here that the sum of these masses for CO2 add up to 47, thus cap 47. We could also measure cap 48, where it's two oxygen 18s bonded to carbon 12. Now, clumped isotopes are much more sensitive to temperature than delta 18O alone. So there's been numerous studies that have built calibration equations to translate the measured isotopic ratio into temperatures. There's been far less studies on clumped isotopes in these island type settings, but most of the temperatures are falling between 20 and 40 degrees here. And that gives us about zero to two per mil SMO for the oxygen isotopic composition of the dolomitizing fluid, which is probably indicative of normal marine conditions or slightly evaporated seawater. Moving on to rare earth elements, which refers to the lanthanide series on the periodic table here. We typically, typically normalize these values to a shale standard and then plot them with increasing atomic number on the base of these diagrams. This here is a plot of modern seawater. And one of the things that should jump out at you right away is this downward deflection in the concentration of cerium. This occurs because cerium has two different redox states and the oxidized cerium-4 is less soluble than the reduced cerium-3. So one of the things that we do is we calculate a cerium anomaly based on this equation on the right here, which is essentially just a measure of the magnitude of this downward deflection here. The larger that negative deflection is, the more oxygenated the fluid. And if this negative deflection were to level off into a straight line, then the fluid is more reduced. Most of these island type dolomites typically have this negative cerium anomaly, which indicates that the dolomitization fluid was well oxygenated. However, if you do compare the cerium anomalies in dolomite to that of seawater or even the limestones in the same successions, you'll notice that they are slightly less negative or that this downward deflection is not as pronounced in dolomite as it is in limestone or in seawater. Now this may indicate that even though the dolomitizing fluid is sourced from oxygenated seawater, as it passes through the carbonate platform, the redox conditions in the pore fluid may be evolving. So after all that characterization, we often consider how the hydrogeological circulation of these fluids 
have contributed to dolomitization in these settings. These are often called dolomitization models, and I really don't have the time to step through each of these individually, but just know that these were originally conceptual models in the sense that they are schematic diagrams of what we think is going on. But over the last maybe 10 to 15 years or so, there's been much more rigorous testing of these types of models by reactive transport modeling. All right, so moving on. The next type of dolomite that we'll discuss here is what many people refer to as structurally controlled hydrothermal dolomite. So the preferred definition here comes from Mockel and Lonnie 2002, where the dolomite formed from a fluid that was at least 5 to 10 degrees hotter than its surrounding environment. And that's important because you can have geothermal dolomitization under elevated PT conditions, but it's simply just a function of burial depth and higher temperatures. And I really just want to emphasize here that there's these three pieces to the puzzle that I've highlighted in blue. You need to know both the dolomitization temperature and the host rock temperature at the timing of dolomitization. Now, the last two of those are a little bit more challenging to evaluate, but I'll walk us through a case study here in Western Canada and how we tackled this problem. This outcrop here comes from the Middle Cambrian Cathedral Formation, which is located in the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. I'll be showing some hyperspectral imaging from this outcrop, and we'll really be looking at how the different perigenetic stages of dolomite vary with respect to this extensional fault here. Now, these types of settings tend to be much more complex than those low temperature dolomites, both petrographically and geochemically. If you take a look at this image on the right, you can see that the replacement dolomite is dark gray in color. We often can make out the original sedimentary structures, and it appears quite finely crystalline under the microscope. In contrast, the saddle dolomite is bright white in outcrop, and it's really quite coarsely crystalline, typically up to five or six centimeters in diameter. So that's easy enough, right? Two phases of dolomite. Let's pack our bags and go home, right? I don't know, not so fast. We conducted hyperspectral imaging on this outcrop here, and based on the spectral characteristics, of the different dolomite phases, we were able to recognize up to 16 different paragenetic stages here in this outcrop. Now, hyperspectral imaging is a function of both the petrographical and geochemical characteristics of these rocks. So let's take a look at some of these results. So hyperspectral imaging uses the incident light from the sun, and the light can be either reflected or scattered before it reaches our detectors here on these blue lines. We measure light in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, here's kind of the wavelength range of our detectors here. Our detectors measure a reflectance value at each of these wavelength increments along these plots, and we obtain a spectrum that is characteristic of each dolomite type here, so each of these colored lines. The main spectral absorption feature that we were interested in here uh, occurred at about 2315 nanometers. And the position of this light absorption feature is highly dependent on which cation is bonded to the carbonate anion. So for calcite, the absorption feature occurs at a slightly longer wavelength than the same absorption feature for magnesite, for example. And this is also true for the calcium to magnesium ratio in dolomite. So the more magnesium rich your dolomite, the position of this absorption band will be pushed a little bit to the left and vice versa for a more calcium rich dolomite. After we obtain that spectral classification, we use an algorithm called Spectral Angle Mapper to assign each pixel in the survey or in a photograph to an individual lithology. Here we see the edge of the dolomite body in the upper part here. So we're really distal away from that extensional fault that I was showing on the earlier slide. And we see that the dolomite here has a bedding parallel termination with limestone, limestone in gray there. And all of these different dolomite types are all really strata bound and forming these little bedding parallel units. Even saddle dolomite here forms within this individual bed. As we step backwards towards the fault, which is located just outside the left side of this lower set of diagrams, we can clearly see that the volume of saddle dolomite in red increases. There's also a spatial relationship between the occurrence of saddle dolomite in red and replacement dolomite two in green. So you can see that this green unit is located right along the margins of the saddle dolomite. 
So we interpreted that as being the effect of recrystallization along the margins of these saddle dolomite units. And in those green units, we typically see uh, increase in crystal size, an increase in dolomite stoichiometry and cation ordering, and changes in temperature and geochemical parameters that would be indicative of recrystallization. For the next chapter of my PhD, I was really interested in the rock textures that we observe in these structurally controlled settings. These are what many people refer to as zebra textures or zebra dolomite. But just know that you can have later mineralization such as fluorite or sphalerite that can replace and overprint the dolomite. So referring to it as zebra dolomite maybe is not necessarily correct. So zebra textures comprise these alternating units of replacement dolomite in gray and saddle dolomite in white. And it makes these rhythmic patterns that occur at a millimeter to centimeter scale. And they form these symmetrical replacement dolomite, saddle dolomite, saddle dolomite, replacement dolomite packages that meet at a central junction between adjacent bands of this saddle dolomite. And there's often a little bit of porosity preserved between the adjacent units of saddle dolomite. And many people have suggested that these form by fracturing, and that's a little bit of fracture porosity left between the adjacent units of saddle dolomite. So as I mentioned, these types of rock textures are most widely considered to have formed by fracturing and cementation. But there's also been a several studies that have suggested that recrystallization, diffusion, and mass transport may play a critical role here in sourcing the material for the precipitation of saddle dolomite. So we took these zebra textures and we approached them through the lens of the learnings that we had from that hyperspectral imaging paper. Basically, that there are far more paragenetic stages here than what we can make out with a naked eye in an outcrop and using just a standard petrographical microscope. So the image on the left here is a map of iron concentrations from the electron microprobe using a three micron stepping interval, so very detailed. Uh, what you can see here is that there's these tens to hundreds of microns scale oscillations of iron enrichment and iron depletion. As many of you may know, iron and manganese co-vary in these systems with an R-squared value greater than, say, 0 0.95. So the manganese maps in these successions on the microprobe look almost identical to the iron maps, just with a lower overall concentration. And these high iron and manganese concentrations are probably indicative of a more reducing dolomitizing fluid here in a burial diagenetic environment. Well, this is also true for the rare earth elements. We did this work on a laser ablation system really targeting these individual growth zones with a 50 micron spot size. We observed that these iron rich growth zones had this characteristic light rare earth element depletion here in the orange line and these really pronounced europium anomalies. So a europium anomaly is essentially the opposite of what I described for the cerium anomaly um, that I was referring to earlier in this presentation. A positive europium anomaly is really considered to be indicative of hydrothermal fluids here, so it's this kind of concave upwards uh, bump. And we really only see this in these hydrothermal structurally controlled settings. Next, we conducted carbonate clumped isotope thermometry on these hydrothermal samples, and the dolomitization temperatures ranged from about 150 degrees Celsius to 350 degrees Celsius, which is some of the hottest examples of these worldwide, I think. Now, that's a pretty large range, but the differences in these localities here strongly co-vary relative to their position and distance from the main epicenter and rifting of rifting and structural deformation in this basin. So this kicking horse rim locality here is located proximal to the rift epicenter and probably where the source of the dolomitizing fluid is coming from. I should also note here that these shifts in the clumped isotope temperatures towards the epicenter of rifting were also observed in the trace and rare earth element geochemistry with higher iron and manganese concentrations at this kicking horse rim locality alongside more pronounced europium anomalies. So based on cross-cutting relationships and all these temperature and compositional variations that we recognized across the basin, we were able to propose a paragenetic sequence for the order of each of these stages and how they manifest in these rocks. First, we have an initial stage of replacement dolomitization, followed by structural deformation, fracturing, and the precipitation of saddle dolomite. You can see here that replacement dolomite 2, RD2, which formed by recrystallization, is only located along the margins of these saddle dolomite units here 
Um, so that's a spatial relationship control that we identified from the hyperspectral survey. Then we have the precipitation of this ferroin iron rich saddle dolomite, which may also further contribute to recrystallization in the succession. Lastly, there's quite a bit of magnesite, lead zinc mineralization, and other types of accessory minerals in these strata, which postdate the final paragenetic stage of dolomite here. So that's kind of the final stage in the sequence. So that type of a conceptual model and paragenetic sequence is great, but we really had no way of constraining whether these processes occurred early or late in the burial history of the basin. And again, remember that defining something as hydrothermal requires you to demonstrate that dolomitization occurred at a higher temperature than the surrounding strata, and not simply just in a deep burial diagenetic environment at elevated PT conditions. To try to tackle this issue, we conducted uranium lead dating on these samples. The depositional age here for the cathedral formation, which is where this plot comes from, is Middle Cambrian, and our dates on the dolomite came out as Middle Cambrian to Middle Ordovician. Based on the burial history of the basin, this means that dolomization occurred at maybe a depth of about two kilometers. If you take a geothermal gradient of about 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer, this would suggest that the surrounding strata was maybe only at 60 degrees Celsius at the time of dolomization. Clearly our clumped isotope temperatures of 150 to 350 degrees at a burial depth of two kilometers would demonstrate and indicate that these fluids were in fact hydrothermal. So based on all the different field petrographical and geochemical data that we collected, we came to this dolmanization model for these types of systems. Based on trace and rare earth element geochemistry, we suggested that seawater and hydrothermal fluids convected within the underlying siliciclastic rocks before migrating upwards along normal and transtensional faults to dolomitize the carbonate platform. In these papers, we also provided a framework for how to interpret the proximity of your succession to the source of the dolomitizing fluid, which may be of interest to many of you watching this presentation. So we've gone through a lot of material here, and I just end this presentation with a few slides on laboratory-based dolomitization experiments and some of the research that I'm now working on for my postdoc. So in doing these experiments, we're following much of the work that has been done by Stephen Kazmarek's research group. We add 200 milligrams of a calcium carbonate reactant, in this case, aragonite, and 15 milliliters of a magnesium calcium chloride solution. We then seal these containers here, and we place them in a temperature-controlled oven for a given period of time. The main difference here between our work and theirs is that we carefully pipette in an ICPMS stock solution, which has a known concentration of a given trace element into each of these reaction vessels. And in the following slides, I'll be discussing some of our work on uranium. So what we do is into one of these vessels, we pipette a very small amount of uranium and track to see how the concentration of uranium evolves in the fluid and in the dolomite throughout the reaction. So this is an example here where we tracked the partitioning behavior of uranium throughout the dolomitization reaction. The light green line here showing a solution that did not have any additional uranium added so all of the uranium in the system must be coming from the dissolving aragonite. And the dissolving aragonite here has about 2,800 ppb of uranium. Then secondly, the dark green line in the upper part of the plot is where we pipetted 0.1 micromolar of uranium into the dolomitizing fluid. So just a very small amount of uranium. As you can see here, there's a considerable portion of the uranium is retained from the aragonite during dolmanization. So we never actually decrease it all the way to zero, even though the fluid itself has no uranium in it. And this occurs like at a much more, uh, re more retention when you compare it to strontium in the upper plots here. So these two plots here show the str strontium concentration in both of these reactions uh, that we had with added uranium. You can also see that the rate at which uranium is released into the solution is much slower when you compare it for strontium. So this type of work may have some implications for the retention and overprinting of geochemical signatures during dolomization, uranium isotopes, strontium isotopes, and as I mentioned before with some of my PhD work, uranium lead dating. 
if we're retaining a lot of uranium from the original aragonite or calcite, this would maybe suggest that when we're dating dolomite, that some of the dates are reflective of the original deposition of the carbonate sediment. In our experiments, there was a first order control on the concentration of uranium in the dolomite that was simply caused by the concentration of uranium in the dolomitizing fluid. So the fluid concentration was the largest control. However, dolomite stoichiometry, so the calcium to magnesium ratio in the dolomite, also played a critical role here, as well as cation ordering. So how well ordered the dolomite crystal structure was. So this may suggest that the dolomite is actually kicking out uranium upon recrystallization in the later parts of these reactions. So in the later parts of this reaction here, where you're recrystallizing some of the dolomite, maybe we're kicking out some of the uranium from the original aragonite that we placed in the reaction vessel. And so these changes in the dolomite stoichiometry and cation ordering also correspond to decreases in the size of the crystallographic unit cell. So the unit cell for the dolomite crystal is actually getting smaller as well too. So maybe is only able to incorporate less amounts of trace elements. All right, so just some conclusions to end this presentation. Carbonate sedimentary rocks have petrographical and geochemical fingerprints that allow us to decipher the timing, fluid source, and mechanism of dolomitization. Low temperature island dolomites, such as those on the Cayman Islands and the Shisha Islands, may retain the geochemical signature of seawater, and these successions could maybe be used to interpret ancient paleoceanographic conditions. On the other hand, the geochemical signature of hydrothermal dolomite is largely reflective of burial diagenetic conditions, but these data may provide us with valuable insights into the flux of diagenetic fluids within a sedimentary basin, alongside the metasomatism and structural deformation of carbonate sedimentary rocks. So just because I know this presentation will be recorded and available online, I'll step through a couple slides of the references that were present throughout the various sections of this presentation. Um, first, just some general review references, references on Cenozoic Island dolomites, structurally controlled hydrothermal dolomite, and then lastly, some of these laboratory-based dolomitization experiments. Thank you all very much for attending this webinar. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Super, thank you so much, Cole. What a uh, wonderful sort of step through different types of, um, you know, dolomite questions and how to approach those questions and different proxies we can use. So um, thank you so much again for joining us. And to everybody out there, the chat is now open. So you can please type your questions into the chat and we will get them over to Cole so that he can sort of read them out for everybody to, uh, to hear. Um, in the meantime, Cole, I found your results really interesting in terms of the, oh, if you want to share your screen, actually keep your screen up. Oh, okay, sure. That'd be helpful, yeah. Um, just so you can flip to any slides in case there yeah. are questions pertaining to that. Um, so I, I found the, um, the different rates of cation replacement really interesting. Um, so you mentioned one, one effect that that might have on sort of previous results in terms of the lead um, uranium lead dating. Is there anything else that you think might need a second look based on those results so far? So referring to this here? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, we want to try to look at this from, you know, the perspective of a lot of different trace elements as well, too. So, you know, I have experience working on uranium lead dating in carbonates, we can per look at how uranium behaves throughout this reaction. We could also do the same type of experiment with lead added into the reaction vessels. There's been a lot of papers suggesting that uranium is much more mobile in carbonate rocks than lead, for example. So a lot of ancient dolomites, when we try to date them using uranium lead dating, they tend to have really high common lead concentrations and very little uranium. So it makes dating these very, very challenging. This here would just be constraining the uranium side of that story, but we could also do this with lead. There's also all sorts of different trace elements and different, you know, um, indicators of fluid conditions that we could investigate here. We talked a little bit about rare earth elements throughout this presentation. We could look at how cerium and europium are incorporated into dolomite as well here. And I don't think anybody's done these types of projects either. So yeah, absolutely. it's really exciting stuff. 
Um, okay, I will get to the the chat. We have um, a question there for you. Um, Dong Yong uh, says, hi, thank you for the good presentation. I have a question about island dolomite. Does the dolomite and calcite have interlayered structures? Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the starting um, calcite and dolomite. I mean, most of these are uh, biota that are constructing their shells out of a single mineral. So for example, the stylophor corals will be made out of aragonite versus the foraminifera will be made out of high magnesium calcite. We have a lot of coral and red algae as well in these successions, which are high magnesium calcite. Um, I'm not aware of any examples where you have a single organism that's building a mixture within a single uh, shell, for example. But in an individual package of rock, clearly you can have a mixture of both aragonite, low magnesium calcite, and high magnesium calcite as well. So some of those diagrams that I was showing above here, for example, you know, on the left here, you have all these branching corals that have been dissolved out. That was probably because they were made up of aragonite, and aragonite is less stable than what would have been the calcite or high magnesium calcite that made up the matrix. And so forams, um, coral and red algae, et cetera. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, yes, and I think he had a follow-up question or maybe um, uh, sort of further details in that question. So when there was limestone and dolomite, so does, I think, does dolomite um, and limestone coexist in the formation? I think you sort of answered that. Yeah, so in, in these individual packages, you tend to see lateral variations in the dolomite content. So how much dolomite there is from the periphery of the island in towards the center. So there's kind of this dolomitization front that is coming from the ocean, maybe entering into the island and it putters out as you get towards the center. So there's some work by Ren and Jones 2017 and 2018 on Grand Cayman, for example, that really mapped out the spatial relationships here in the lower part of the Cayman formation. And there's kind of this lateral transition between calcite or dolomite on the periphery of the island into calcite at the center of the island. Okay, perfect. I think that got right to the heart of his question because he mentioned slide 18 and there you are. So perfect. Um, he says, thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Amelia. Hi, Amelia. Um, she says, thanks for a great presentation and congratulations on excellent research. Do you think it's possible to test for pos um, to test for formation mechanisms of zebra dolomite? You mentioned fracturing, but could it also form through oscillating dolomitization fronts as in other mineral systems? Yeah, I think so that that's, you know, really the focus of what we did um, kind of in my 2023 paper here was really looking at spatial controls on these different rock textures. And I think, you know, there's a few different models for how these zebra textures form some, you know, maybe through this oscillation dolmization fronts, others through recrystallization. I think what we showed in this paper is that when you're in lower temperature settings, and you're a little bit further away from the source of the dolomitizing fluid, these are pretty clearly fractures that have been cemented by saddle dolomite. But when you get into these high temperature settings, which are really like in low grade metamorphic conditions, you know, 300 degrees Celsius, there's a lot more diffusive processes that are going on. And you can look at these in outcrop and there's, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the outcrop is made up of saddle dolomite, but you don't really see this clear volumetric dilatation in the strata above or below. So how do you cause this by extensional or dilatational fracturing and cementation when there's no real volume expansion going on? So there has to be some sort of conservation of volume in those types of settings. So, you know, the, what we proposed in this McCormick AL 2023 paper is that there's really this kind of, you know, balance or lever where based on the pressure temperature conditions, you maybe are favoring fracturing in one end member of the situation. But as you get into low grade metamorphic conditions, the same mechanisms are at play, but you're at different conditions. So, you know, maybe it's a combination of both processes and it's a function of temperature, for example. Okay, yeah, that seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, thanks for the question, Amelia. If there are any other questions, please type them into the chat now. We'll give you a few more minutes. And in the meantime, um, I will let you know that in a couple of weeks, SEDS Online will be at the IAS conference in Aberdeen. And so you can be on the lookout for more details regarding that. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you twice in month, one month. Um, and Amelia says, thanks, Cole. Okay, so if there are no other questions. Um, Cole, thank you so much again for your presentation. Um, what wonderful work you've been up to. And um, yes, Suds Online will also be at the Early Career Researcher events. 
Um, and that I think is on Tuesday evening at the IS conference at um, at a pub. So I'm guessing there will be drink tickets. Yes, Tuesday at 7 p.m. So come and join us at the Early Career Researcher event at BrewDog. Yes, and um, then we will have another event in terms of a scientific presentation. And so, yeah, be on the lookout for that. We're excited to see hopefully some of you guys in person and then the rest of you online. Uh, thank you again, Cole, and we look forward to seeing everyone soon.